So I'm going to talk, I'm going to spend about half my talk giving sort of general background about uh, sort of electronic structure calculations. And then in the second half, uh, talk about my experiences with machine learning and specifically trying to use it to create new density functionals. Okay. And so at this great conference, we have many people with many different backgrounds. It's focused a lot, I think, on sort of electronic structure. Uh, but this is a huge field these days. And this is the first slide I ever made when I started at this about 25 or 30 years ago. And it's pictures of all sorts of different materials all being held together. They're just nuclei held together by indistinguishable electrons. And it would be nice to be able to answer questions like what can exist and what are its properties uh, in many uh, parts of, let's call it everyday science and even materials these days under extreme conditions. Okay, and so for throughout the talk, I'll make the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, uh, separate the electrons from the nuclei and our basic task is to find the ground, is used often to find the ground state energy as a function of the nuclear coordinates. If you think about the purpose of 90, let's say 99% uh, maybe of electronic structure calculations, that's what they're doing. Uh, that's what you extract from the calculation. Uh, classical force fields where we sort of ignore the quantum mechanics or at least encode it empirically are very fast and very cheap. Uh, they're used for huge biosimulations for molecular dynamics, but they typically fail when bonds break. Although of course, many people work on that. Uh, simple classical force fields do. And uh, so you can do huge systems for long spans of time, uh, but uh, you often can't do sort of chemical reactions. And I earlier, this morning we heard uh, Roberto talking about their fantastic work where they're doing essentially DFT type calculations on these sorts of scales. And we've just heard from Frank about quantum solvers for electrons, often in the form of some kind of approximate solution of the Schrodinger equation. Couple cluster is uh, the standard tool in, in quantum chemistry, singles, doubles, and perturbative triples. Uh, it doesn't work so good for multi-reference systems, but quantum chemists have ways of dealing with them. Uh, often it's quantum Monte Carlo in physics, as we just heard. And of course, it's typically, you know, much, much more expensive than force fields. Uh, and even getting to something like a hundred atoms uh, uh, can be very demanding. Okay. Uh, so one thing I like to emphasize is that different people who are doing these calculations have different goals, right? In condensed matter physics and, and sort of physics of materials, especially materials with exotic properties, people are often much more interested in response properties and spectral properties. Uh, and often they're interested in strongly correlated systems. Often in these systems, electrons localize on the atoms. Uh, and on top of this, of course, if you're doing materials, uh, you are always looking at the, or almost always looking at the thermodynamic limit. You want bulk properties. Uh, trying to get there from uh, finite clusters uh, is sort of often expensive and not a good way to approach that limit. Uh, on the other hand, chemistry and material science need reliable accurate solvers and they, to get energy, energy differences, not total energies, to, to often extremely high accuracy. So the standard measure is one kilocal per mole or about one and a half millihartries. And if you get that kind of accuracy, you can predict a lot of chemistry uh, for at least covalent bonds. And then for weak bonds, the scale is, is tinier still. And an error of one kilocal per mole in a reaction barrier will change the rate of a reaction by a factor of five at room temperature. So if you're doing drug design, uh, that's really important. 
uh, you'll get very wrong answers as to which reaction goes, even if you have only very small errors. So that very high accuracy is sort of required. Uh, and you know, you want to, I mean, minimizing the energy tells you the geometry and energy differences tell you the thermochemistry. Lots and lots of the basic questions that you want to answer require that sort of accuracy. So it determines the structure of molecules and solids. And, and most problems in chemistry are weakly correlated. Uh, we see the effects of strong correlation when we stretch bonds, because then the electrons do localize on two sites. Uh, but typically the idea of sort of strong correlation in materials is somewhat stretching bonds so that things localize, but also uh, that you go to the thermodynamic limit. Okay. So in some ways, one of the greatest free lunches ever was this creation of density functional theory. So that's my area. Uh, and that's what I'll talk about. Uh, so 64, Holmberg and Cohn proved this very abstract theorem uh, that has very little direct content, uh, but that you can, in principle, get the energy from a variational principle based on the density. Uh, but much more practically important was the creation of the cone sham equations uh, the next year uh, so that you could replace your density functional calculation by an orbital calculation uh, and you would only need to approximate a very small fraction of the entire energy. Uh, and here's Walter Cohn. Uh, he passed away about four years ago. And here are these cone sham equations uh, for the simplest system you can really imagine, a helium atom. And uh, so they're fictitious non-interacting electrons that uh, sit in a multiplicative potential but that potential is defined so that the, the density of these fake electrons equals the exact ground state density of your system. And when you follow the logic of that, you discover that you can write your functional uh, in terms of properties of these fake electrons, the, the uh, cone sham kinetic energy, the kinetic energy of these non-interacting electrons, the Hartree energy, U, and the small piece of unknown uh, exchange correlation energy. And the important thing they did was they showed, and this was all in a footnote, that the exchange correlation potential that you need to construct this potential is just the functional derivative of the exchange correlation energy. And this is an exact uh, scheme. And on the right here, I have a picture of the exact ground state density of helium from my friend Cyrus Umregar, uh, calculated with a very uh, careful quantum Monte Carlo calculation. So doing the wave function calculation exactly. And then we see the red line here is the exact cone sham potential for the helium atom. Uh, and it's unique and the cone sham calculation approximates that potential, solves things self-consistently. Uh, all the DFT calculations cone sham DFT calculations in the world, which is almost all that are going on today, use this scheme and they approximate Vs, not the real potential uh, to get the exact density. And more importantly, they extract the, uh, the energy. Now, of course, you've simply buried all the complications of the quantum anybody problem in this exchange correlation energy. In practical codes, you must approximate it. And today's standard uh, exchange correlation approximations, they start with the simplest kind of density functional you can imagine, a local density approximation. Uh, Dirac uh, wrote this down in 1930, but I think Bloch actually wrote it in 29. Uh, and it's the uh, exchange energy of the uniform gas. You can do it uh, by hand and a few get a good approximation to the correlation energy of the uniform gas, you can do LDA calculations. Generalized gradient approximations took about a generation to develop from 19, starting in about 1968, work of Ma and Bruckner, and sort of coming to fruition uh, around 19, starting about 1986, 87, 
Uh, so, so GGAs, generalized gradient approximations, use both the density and its gradient to approximate uh, uh, the, this unknown exchange correlation energy. And then, in, especially in chemistry, people often use hybrids, global hybrids, where they replace some fraction of uh, the exchange energy with that of the exact exchange, typically Hartree-Fock. And so the standard functional most commonly used in chemistry today, B3-LIP, mixes in about 20% of exact exchange. Uh, and these are functionals that were all developed at least 20 years ago. And of course, modern calculations add in lots of important uh, things, uh, such as uh, dispersion uh, corrections uh, and, and, and many other uh, range separation to make, for example, the uh, HSE06 uh, hybrid functional. Uh, and people run not just cone sham, but generalized cone sham calculations and get improved gaps. Okay. But an important point is that this, this, this scheme uh, has become absurdly useful, right? This is from a review already seven years old, uh, but showing how many thousands of papers at that time each year uh, were uh, using cone sham DFT. And uh, I estimate that it's at least over 40,000 by now. Uh, okay. Now, one important thing is paying the price of the cone sham equations. So we saw that sort of DFT is very relatively inexpensive for a quantum solver. It's sort of cheaper uh, if you don't use a hybrid than Hartree-Fock, uh, but you still have to solve the orbital equations. Uh, so, so that scales like N cubed. And so uh, often with a sort of standard machine and, and so forth, you might do 500 atoms in a day. Uh, now, the theorems of density functional theory tell you that, in principle, you don't have to solve those orbital equations if you knew the kinetic energy functional of the non-interacting electrons well enough, accurately enough, you could minimize that for any given problem, find the density, and, uh, uh, and, and, and be able to do your electronic structure calculation. Uh, so this is often called orbital-free DFT these days. Uh, so avoiding the cone sham orbitals. Okay, now a couple of sort of uh, deeper background points, especially since some of the people at this conference are sort of from more strongly correlated background. This is work I did over the last few years with, in collaboration with Steve White here at UCI in the physics department. Uh, Steve White created DMRG and it's become one of the standard solvers and it's in a certain sense the best quantum solver especially if your problem is one-dimensional uh, and, and can handle problems that CCSDT cannot. Uh, and here we did a sort of model calculation uh, sort of illustrating various important points about density uh, functionals. So we took a chain of hydrogen atoms and we stretched them uh, far apart so that they became a Mott insulator. Uh, so this was not a conducting chain, it was an insulating chain. And uh, what we did was we actually did the calculations with a finite number and then took the number to, uh, to very large. So going to the thermodynamic limit. And we were illustrating this very basic point that we had the exact exchange correlation functional for this problem. We got it by inverting. Uh, we get the ground state density and find a cone champ potential, just like I showed you for the helium atom. And you see that the, because this is the paradigm system of a Mott insulator, the, it's always a band metal, a cone sham metal, and you see the exact cone sham gap is going to zero but the true gap uh, of the system, the charge gap is about 10 electron volts. And this does not mean that there's anything wrong with your density functional calculation. The density functional calculation is exact. It just only tells you things about ground state energies and densities. And the gap is not directly, uh, the cone sham gap is not equal to the true gap. 
in fact, we could get the true gap from a DFT calculation, which we did by adding and removing electrons from a finite chain. But of course, you don't, it's hard to exercise that option uh, in a periodic code. Uh, sometime later, there's this paper uh, I was involved with with John Perdue and many co-authors where we sort of analyze uh, gaps with approximate functionals uh, and especially with the generalized cone cham theory and why hybrid functionals and, and uh, meta GGAs give better gaps in when you do a generalized cone cham treatment. Okay, and then on the other hand, right, uh, looking at DFT approximations, I've spent about 15 years trying to understand why these very simple approximations work as well as they do. Uh, if you think about it, this, well, there's lots of reasons why it's a very hard many-body problem, uh, many uh, fermion problem, and yet these very simple formulas, often very crude formulas, give you a lot usefully accurate results. Uh, and trying to find the right mathematical approach for that has been hard. Uh, uh, and in fact, in, in the last, I spent a sabbatical at the University of Bristol and I ran into a friend, Michael Berry, and we worked together quite hard on this. And over the last 30 years, he's developed a lot of these asymptotic methods, uh, especially at that time for use in quantum chaos, but now being used throughout physics. Uh, and in particular, his method of hyper asymptotics, where you resum asymptotic expansions to get much more accurate results than before. Uh, and there's a couple of papers with our names together on them from last year and this year. Uh, and in some cases, we were able to solve model electronic structure problems with fractional errors of about 10 to the minus 33. And that's not a typo. Uh, now, of course, we were just sort of uh, proving just how good this result could be, but uh, uh, it would be, you would be hard put to find any numerical solver that could check uh, the accuracy of such a calculation. Now, this is doing expansions to uh, very high orders, which in practice you could never do, but if we can just uh, do uh, a few orders, we can get much higher accuracy. Uh, and so, and, and in fact, we're able to identify the error in the standard approach to deriving density functionals. And in these model cases, which we don't yet know how to generalize, we can get much more, uh, we can get highly accurate results. So people take for granted that DFT is always a moderate accuracy theory. Well, in these model cases, uh, we can make it essentially as accurate as you like. Uh, these kinds of techniques might be helpful in, in putting a sort of rigorous basis to dynamical mean field theory. And also we suspect that they're related to how DMRG works for wave functions as opposed to what we were doing is relevant to density functions. Okay, so that's sort of background on uh, sort of DFT things. And now I turn to my main topic, which is uh, the machine learning of density functionals. So, and I'll skip quickly over some of this stuff because it's background and you're gonna hear uh, in these four days uh, about a lot of this stuff, right? Uh, so people are constructing very accurate force fields and these are beginning to really pay off these days. Uh, and there are also these data repositories of DFT calculations uh, that people are data mining for uh, new materials and so forth. Uh, so flavors of MLDFT uh, are, you can, two types of activity are quite distinct. One is you take the human made approximations that we use and try to make them a bit better. So you use the machine learning to fit the forms better, see if you can make them more accurate. Alternatively, uh, you can try to create totally different kinds of density functionals totally non-local so that they won't have the same failings as our human made ones. And most of my work uh, has been involved with the second kind. So trying to find, for example, functionals that don't fail when you stretch bonds uh, because our standard density functionals do fail under those circumstances. 
And about 10 years ago with some friends, we did this demo problem. We just took particles in a box. We tried to uh, find, uh, uh, just a, a pretend they're non-interacting cone sham electrons. Could we find this kinetic energy functional accurately enough? And we use kernel rage regression. And the important point here is that, our, and a Gaussian kernel, but our metric is this integral over the density difference between two densities. So this is a total non-local functional of the density. This kernel sort of measures the, uh, the distance between a couple of densities, but it's entirely non-local. And then we write the kinetic energy functional as a sum of these. Uh, and we have a set of, this is supervised learning. We have a set of data that we learn from. And we very quickly were able to get very accurate energies. So with about, you know, uh, a few, uh, about 100 data points, uh, we could get errors less than a kilocal per mole, whereas the local approximation is about 200 kilocals per mole for this problem. Uh, and then we had quite a lot of trouble getting the derivative right, but we figured out how to do a projection in the directions in which the uh, uh, we had, uh, information and, and those projections would work well and we were able to get approximate densities which is the point of doing this and get good enough uh, energy so that was a, like a little model problem and that was eight years ago and all this work is in collaboration this work is with klaus robert Mueller, who we've heard uh, a little about uh, earlier and matthias rupp was his postdoc at the time uh, then uh, of course this was a, a, a proof of principle, then we want to get back to, uh, you know, all the kinds of things that people use the electronic structure calculations for. And at the moment, we're sort of on the small molecules uh, uh, point, and we haven't yet gotten to very large systems. Uh, on the way, though, uh, we sort of did a lot of work thinking about how these machine learning methods work, how, how to construct these functionals. And a paper that's quite popular is one by an undergraduate, Kevin Vu, where we simply looked at fitting a simple function, a cosine as a function, uh, using these methods and then compared to what was that to what was going on inside our, our density functional. And this way you could see a lot of understand much better uh, what happens with these these kernel methods. Okay. Kiro, you have roughly five minutes. Okay, yep, I'm, I'm getting there, I'm almost there, yeah. So more recently, uh, I think this is three years ago, uh, an excellent graduate student, Felix Brockard with Klaus, and then we brought in Mark Tuckerman and Leslie Vogt, uh, his postdoc, uh, they, we did a, we did, we used our schemes to construct a force, uh, uh, construct a density functional not just for the energy, but also for the potential. So that's why it's called bypassing the cone sham equations. So we had to give up on our old projection methods. They became too expensive. Uh, so we get uh, both the self-consistent density and the energy from the machine learning. And then we ran MD on this small molecule, malin aldehyde. And I don't think my movie is, is showing for some reason. Uh, the, the movie isn't changing. Well, what happens in the movie is the proton here uh, moves over from one oxygen to another. And what was nice about that is that this was not in our, our training set. So we trained it by just doing cone sham DFT at finite temperatures, take snapshots, learn the functional uh, from those snapshots and then run our own uh, MD. Uh, and so, but this, this got a lot of attention because uh, the, this was the first MD with a machine learned density functional and it showed that it could uh, reproduce the results of, a, of, a, of the cone sham DFT uh, very well. Okay. Uh, We've also checked out exact conditions, which is what people usually do. And in some cases, they can certainly make things much more efficient for the machine learning if you use exact conditions that are known from DFT. Uh, so an important point uh, is the representation of the data. So I'm going to sort of skip over that, except to say that we applied all this to our hydrogen chains. 
and we were able to get uh, for a strongly correlated system, the thermodynamic limit of that system uh, using machine learned functionals. Uh, so this was doing the exchange and correlation together. Uh, this was again in collaboration with Steve White. And then going back to our molecular calculations, this is a most recent one from a year ago. And we call this Delta DFT because instead of training on DFT, we trained on couple clusters. So more accurate for this molecule resource and all. And we found that we could learn the error made by a density, this a human designed density functional, PBE in this case, was easier to learn that the error it makes than learning the functional itself. So using this kind of uh, scheme, you can run a, a DFT molecular dynamic simulation and use the machine learning to correct the forces uh, and energies to be those of couple cluster. Uh, and this, this wiggle here is the, P, the functional messing up a rotation barrier, but the couple cluster getting it right. Uh, okay. So and lots of other people, and you'll hear from one of them after lunch. Uh, for example, Marivi are also doing this. Uh, lots of people are trying all sorts of different things and, uh, and, and doing very well. Uh, Okay, and one last little point is, you know, there's a lot of discussion of interpolation versus extrapolation. And I like to emphasize that in a sense, comb sham DFT with a reasonable approximation extrapolates to almost any unknown uh, situation. You know, you kind of know when it works and when it doesn't work, but I'm not so sure about all the sort of ML force fields or even our ML density functionals we kind of find these holes where, uh, where there are always sort of new directions in which you don't have data. Uh, I'm just raising this, people are beginning to notice this in some of these simulations. Okay, so this is what I've said. Uh, uh, our work is not yet available in the code you use because it's still sort of prototype stuff. Uh, and thanks to all the students, to, to you guys for listening and the funders uh, for for this work. Thank you very much.